Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Keith Best of Onto Innovation. We're going to talk today about advanced IC substrate overlay optimization. Keith, what are the problems with overlay and how do we optimize it? Yeah, advanced IC substrate is very different than the usual silicon uh, overlay challenges. In this case, we have to deal with a couple of things. First of all, there's the actual substrate distortion as it goes through the process flow. There's 24 layers of RDL, 24 layers of ABF, and this particular ABF, a genome motor build-up film, requires curing. And each curing cycle subjects the panel to thermal processing. And 24 layers of this, the panel will change shape because copper cad laminate is made up of glass fiber core with copper on either side. And this fiber is unstable at uh, temperature and uh, cycling. This is almost like when you think about fiberglass, right? Where you have all those threads coming through. That's exactly right. In fact, you have them orthogonal to each other, so they expand at different rates. You'll see X and Y scaling completely different, and then towards the edge of the panel, you get some strange effects, which could be even trapezoidal. So trying to get good overlay performance requires a complex lens with the ability to adjust to various parameters, and then a, an intrinsic algorithm that helps you understand the terms that are, are errors terms, to be able to model them and be able to actually apply the corrections that give you good overlay. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Keith, how does it all work? Good question. So like I said earlier, the challenge is just a little different than silicon. We have two things to worry about here. We have the substrate that I mentioned before, moving around during the thermal cycling, but also the via layer. We're talking about learning an RDL structure to a via layer, and the via itself is defined using a laser drill tool. And the laser drill tool punches holes, basically, in the ABF. Very unlike uh, most processing you're familiar with. How does the process progress here? Okay, so we start out with laser drilled holes through ABF, and then, of course, after you've gone through that step, you're going to go to lithography, where you'll put a layer of dry film uh, photoresist on top of the uh, substrate on both sides. You'll then expose both sides of the panel, and then remove the uh, protective film, develop the panel, and go through to inspection. Now, when you get to the AOI, you're going to try and measure the overlay. And of course, then you're going to have some information, which you'll send back to some software, and you may send this back to the stepper, what we would call a feedback, or in the old days, what was called an APC. So this is a way to actually tell the stepper, hey, you know what, uh, based upon what I've measured, you need to make some adjustments to your lens to adjust for scaling, rotation, uh, asymmetric magnification, and a whole bunch of other stepper terms. That's one approach to be able to solve the problem. But then, of course, if we go back to the uh, laser drill tool, we could consider doing feed forward. So we take the laser drill information to the software package and then feed forward that to the stepper. That way you'd know in advance the actual layout of the via holes, be able to accommodate them using your stepper capability and then get to the AOI and hopefully get good results. What's interesting about the whole approach is that you could probably end up having the AOI fine tune your modeling for the actual feed forward. When you get the residual values to be very, very low, that means you have a very successful feed forward algorithm. So that's really the ultimate challenge and solution. You're building real-time analytics into this process, right? Yes, in fact, that's the only way to be able to accommodate the various degrees of movement moving around. In fact, at the bottom here, I'll show an example of what we're dealing with. So in the copper cloud laminate world, we have a typical, well, I guess an advanced copper cloud laminate process with 5.5, that's an RDL line space. But at the end of the uh, RDL trace, there's this massive, great big RDL capture pad. And typically, the laser drilled holes are 30 microns. So if you have a 30 micron laser drilled hole, you must have a pad that's 70 microns to give yourself 20 microns of overlay error capability. So if we can get better overlay performance in this feedback or feed forward methodology, we can shrink the overlay tolerance and then reduce the size of this pad. If we can do that, we can squeeze more uh, line spaces into the layer to reduce the number of layers. As a result, we reduce cost. What has to change in order to do that? Well, that's interesting too. <laughs> so um, there are a number of things. Some of the thermal cycling we talked about before that needs some characterization. If you can characterize every layer as you go through the process flow, you might be able to understand a little bit more about uh, how to prevent some of the excursion that we talked about. That will obviously help just intrinsically in the panel itself. But of course, if you can't do that, and you're relying on your stepper to try and get better performance. I think be able to communicate between the laser drill tool and the stepper would really help. In fact, you could actually match the two grids together. If you knew the grid or the state performance and uh, orthogonality and scaling of the laser tool and have the same grid of the stepper, feed forward information would be a lot easier. What happens with glass? Yes, glass is what everybody's looking at right now because all the things I've talked about here are removed effectively because 
glass is very well behaved. As you heat it up and cool it down, it's got a very um, a well curved for thermal expansion. It's so well understood. It will not do the same thing the copper cloud laminate will because it's not filled with the fibers. Of course, if you take that into consideration and you look at what you can do with glass, if you're doing a 2 2 micron RDL structure, you can now reduce the size of this um, landing pad for the RDL down to, say, 12 microns with a via of 9 microns. And of course, now you have a tolerance of 1.5 micron overlay. So you've got better compression of all your um, RDL structures into a, a very high, fine resolution layout but of course now you need to have better overlay but because it's glass it won't move around as much so this one and a half microns is actually doable in production one of the things that's quite interesting here though is the fact that you're now using a, a nine micron via you can't do nine micron vias with laser drilling you're going to have to move into a different approach either using a photo imageable dielectric like a polyimide or some hard mass technique which is a whole different uh, conversation but uh, you can see how getting the uh, glass into play really helps you reduce the actual uh, resolution performance here down to 2.2 at the same time helps you get less layers which will reduce the cost. Basically what you've done is say okay we can live within a much tighter tolerance than we could in the past right? That's right in fact uh, if, you, if you can solve all the other problems with glass which you talked about earlier uh, this fragility and uh, ability to be handled through the facility then you're going to get a great result in the end. What has to change? I mean, that's one piece of it. What else has to be changed in order to make all that work? Yeah, I think some of the fab automation has to be employed because you're coming from a PCB world where that didn't exist. You go through copper cloud laminate where there's an element of kind of front end thought processes with defect inspection and overlay measurements and some feedback information. But when you move into the glass world, you're going to need to bring more of your front end metrology, front end capability to help that actually happen. And I think that's really where some of the automation, uh, basically having mechanical handling of all the substrates, no human interaction because they're so thin, anybody that picks them up will probably break them. And you can't really tolerate having broken panels of glass in your plating system because to try and clean it up will be a huge, huge issue. And just to put this in perspective, this is not for the most advanced chips. This is for potentially most advanced chips in a package, right? Yes, it facilitates the, the, uh, the package to be much more high performance. But that's the thing. When you get to embedded chips, what happens with glass versus whatever was there before? Yes, actually, the glass embedded uh, composition is quite a good one. In fact, you can probably place the embedded chips or passive uh, devices much more accurately within the core because it's stable. It's not going to move around. If you start placing these within the copper cloud laminate, they're going to move around. There'll be uh, you know, tilt issues, height issues, and that will give you problems with, uh, with yield if you try to plate those types of things. They're not in the right place. And in the copper laminates, from what you were talking about before, those are the ones that will go from a square or a rectangle into a trapezoid? Well, yeah, that's an exact, kind of gross exaggeration, but essentially that's what's going to happen because the copper cloud laminate core is, is, is not well controlled. It's made out of fiberglass, which would use to patch holes in your car. <laughs> so now you're trying to make that uh, high-end uh, you know, substrate. It's, it's not going to be easy. When you have large geometries and you're moving in a kind of you know, 20 micron overlay space, okay. But now you talk about one and a half micron overlay, you need, you need to sort of get things a little bit more front end focused, as it were. So really what you're doing is taking the same kind of precision that we used to use in SOCs and now building it into a package, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's now a, it's now a much bigger package with much more functionality, which gives the performance that's required for these uh, high end applications. So what's missing out of this? So we've got the glass. We understand how that's going to work. What is going to make this work in high volume manufacturing? Yes. In fact, uh, what's going to happen is some of the actual other processes will change. So you're familiar with electrolyst uh, copper plating. It will now become more electroplating uh, and have different types of seed materials. So you've gone from electrolyst, you know, seed into now a PVD type of seed. So again, front end type of uh, capability. And the reason for this is to get much smoother metal lines. So we have the glass, which is your stability, but the actual signal integrity is dependent on the actual roughness of the metal line. Now, not just in the uh, X, Y dimension, but also in the Z dimension, the top and the bottom of the line also needs to be smooth. So the surface that the PVD tie copper is going to be put down on is also needs to be very smooth. So that's another reason to uh, develop new technology in that space. So progress in the past was pretty much defined by EUV. That was the deciding factor. Now what we're dealing with is material science and chemistry, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And also some of the architecture. 
And you see some of the designers now taking advantage of this new space. So there was no, there was no silicon core. And now you have a glass core or a fiberglass core, and you can put things in there, which previously wasn't possible. So it gives the designers a much more, well, I don't know, uh, creativity. And you see a lot of new patterns coming out in this space. It's, uh, it's like Moore's Law in the back end versus the front end. Keith Best, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.